Um, so when it, when it comes to stopping smoking, obviously, realistically, the main goal is you hope that people never start in the first place. I'm sure a lot of us kind of wonder nowadays, why does anyone pick up a cigarette? But it happens. And the difficulty with stopping smoking is that it is, you know, people you've probably heard the thing, oh, it's as hard to stop as heroin. Um, it is very, very difficult. 80% of patients that try and quit smoking will start again within the first month. So I've got some patients tell me, oh, it's easy, I, I quit every month. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's pretty simple. Um, after six months, only 3% have actually quit smoking. So, you know, we've got medications and we try certain things, but obviously it's not the most effective thing if these are our numbers uh, that we're trying to get people to quit. So over many years, I'm trying to say, okay, what it is that I can do differently to help people with, you know, stopping smoking? Is there something else that we can do? Even the medication that we use, it's about one and a half times more effective than placebo, which sounds like, oh, well, that's pretty good. Not when you realize the quitting numbers are really small. So in general, the total number is very, very small. So this is something that I go through with my patients when they're off in the office and say, okay, we're gonna try something a little bit different. We're gonna try and um, have you change some things. So I tell them to really focus on, it's just not a matter, first of all, they have to wanna to quit. If they don't want to quit, they're not going to. So you really gotta get them to understand, do you want to quit? Is this something you're, well, yeah, I think I'll try it it's not gonna work. You've got to know, you can keep working on it, but they've gotta to wanna to quit. Uh, and then say, you know, it's not just about, you know, stopping the smoking and putting the cigarettes down. There's a lot of other things that are associated with smoking that make it very difficult to quit. We've gotta to learn to change habits that we associate with this, because it's not just the cigarettes, it's all the things that we associate with the smoking. So one of the things that I'll have patients do um, is tell them to smoke with their opposite hand. Now, I always ask them, what hand do you smoke with, right or left? And they, almost everyone can tell me it's one or the other. Very rarely, well, I just use whatever hand. No, they've, they've got one. So you know, you've got the person, yeah, I smoke with my left hand. Well, they can sit there and do this, probably type on their computer, talk on their phone, text their friends, without dropping a beat. I mean, it just, it is not gonna quit. That is so natural, they don't even pay attention to it anymore. So I tell them, switch to the opposite hand. This is a very unnatural movement for a left-handed smoker. I said, no switching. It's got to stay in your right hand. So that'll, that'll do a couple of things. One, it's going to feel very strange to do this, so they're not going to do it. So where's that cigarette going to be? It's going to be hanging down here, less time that they're inhaling. It's going to burn a little bit, so they'll probably actually less smoke that they're breathing in. But by switching their hands, they've got this unnatural movement while they're working on changing these processes. And a lot of times that's a big step to help, um, is making it a little bit unnatural. Because again, they just want not think to do this with their right hand. The next thing I tell them, don't smoke in the house or in the car. So for people that smoke in their house, obviously that's a big issue with secondhand smoke and people in the home, especially if there's young children. But, you know, if they've got to step outside when it's 20 degrees outside, they're gonna think a little bit differently. Uh, or if it's here blistering hot, uh, they're gonna think a little bit differently. Um, when I tell people, don't smoke in their car, this isn't just, all right, well just don't smoke in your car. I make it tough on them. I say, all right, when you go to get in your car, you take your cigarettes out of your pocket or your purse or your coat, and you put them in the trunk, or you put them in the back of your SUV or something, not some place you could just reach over and grab them, because they're gonna go down the road, sorry to offend anyone, a New Yorker's gonna cut you off <laughs> because they don't know where they're going, and you're gonna get mad, and the first thing you're gonna do is, I'm stressed, I need a cigarette. And if they're sitting right next to you, you're going to pick them up and smoke them. So by keeping them far away, where they don't have access to them when they're going down the road, this is gonna make things a lot more difficult. Again, the idea is that they don't smoke nearly as much, and this is gonna create um, sort of a, a barrier 
uh, that makes it a little bit harder for them to easily just reach in their purse or reach in their coat pocket or reach up on their dashboard, grab their cigarettes and start smoking again. Because they'll do it before they even realize they're smoking sometimes. So put a little challenge in there. So next thing I tell them to do is only carry the number of cigarettes that you're planning to smoke. Now I tell them I divide your cigarettes up into two types of cigarettes. There's a cigarette that you can set your watch by. You know, every morning you get up, you have a cigarette. Every time, you know, they know it's, oh, it's 10.45, I need a cigarette. I mean, they don't even have to look at a clock, and they smoke at the same time, same event, every day. Then you've got the second cigarette. That's the one where they're walking into Walmart, and they're just kind of meandering in. They take a few puffs on their cigarette. They get to the front door, a few more deep puffs, and they put it out. Or they're running around the store and they're like waiting for somebody, hey, I'm going to run out and have a cigarette real quick. Those are very easy to get rid of because those are things that they don't have habits associated with them. So I'll tell people, you know, you could probably get rid of almost half the cigarettes that you smoke in a day because a lot of them you may puff on six or eight times and then you put it out when you walk into the store. So you're, you're really not necessarily smoking very much of them. So we want to get rid of those. So I'll say, you know what, let's, let's say you, know, you smoke a pack a day. You probably eight are your quickie cigarettes when you're just walking around or waiting. You can get rid of those. So you're going to smoke 12 cigarettes a day. So what they'll do is they're going to take every cigarette they own. They're going to put them in a shoebox in the back closet in a bedroom under a pile of sweaters. That means, you know, on the countertop, the glove box, in the living room, wherever they have cigarettes laying around, all of them. So when they get up in the morning, they've got to go under the sweaters, grab the shoe box, pull out their pack of cigarettes, and they're going to take eight cigarettes, and they're going to put 12 in their pocket. If they carry a pack of cigarettes, they will smoke a pack of cigarettes. Okay? But you limit it. So they'll be paying attention to how many they've got in their pocket. So um, what, you, what they want to do is start changing some habits that they associate with smoking. They want to remove one of these cigarettes. Uh, so once a week, I say, all right, figure out those times. And this is some things they can kind of be doing in the first day or two. What are those times that you smoke every single day like clockwork? And say they get up in the morning and they have their cup of coffee and they have their cigarette. You say, okay, I'm getting rid of my morning cigarette. So at that point on, they're down to 11 cigarettes, so they get up, they only put 11 in the pack, and they don't have that morning cigarette. And from that moment on, they never have that morning cigarette. It, it's not flipping it around to pick another time, they devote that morning cigarette. Say they come home, you know, uh, or they're at a lunch uh, mid-afternoon break or something, and they smoke one then. You know, their next one might be, okay, I'm going to get rid of that one. So now they're carrying 10. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they're going to have to find something else they do to occupy their time to change the habits they associate with that smoking. It might be after dinner, they go and have a smoke after dinner, that one goes away. And about every week, they're going to be taking a cigarette out of that pack. So pretty soon, they're carrying five cigarettes, four cigarettes, three cigarettes, and they're changing the habits. So it's not just throwing the cigarettes away and I'm not going to smoke anymore. They're changing the habits you associate with smoking because that will help reinforce them. And they've got to change some things. You may get up in the morning, have your coffee, and read the paper. Um, now, you have your morning coffee and you read your paper in the afternoon or something. You're going to have to change those types of things, find a way to occupy your time from that cigarette uh, and as you're whittling those down. So the thing I tell people, it would be great to believe that your, their health would be their primary concern to stop smoking. It doesn't. If it would, we wouldn't even be having this discussion because there is probably not a person in this country anyway that understands that smoking isn't good for you. Everybody knows that when they pick up their cigarettes and start smoking. Everybody knows that when they're smoking and they're having health problems. Um, it, it's not a mystery. Um, money talks. So I say, all right, here's what you're going to do. In this area, and I looked it up regionally, cigarettes are cost about a $6 a pack. Now, if you get places like New York, Chicago, Dallas, Seattle, San Francisco, they're paying about $12, $13 a pack for cigarettes. 
I said, around here, they're about six bucks a pack. So I said, all right, you're going to take five dollars every day out of your wallet. You're going to get a big jar of those water jugs, take the water out, and put five dollars in there every single day. Well, they say, oh, I can't afford that. Well, you can because you're spending more than that on cigarettes. So every day, you smoke two packs of cigarettes a day, you're going to put ten dollars in that jug. Every day, you're going to put it in there. While you're working, changing the habits, while you're cutting back on the cigarettes that you're carrying, you're putting money into that jar. At the end of one year at five dollars a day, it's eighteen hundred and twenty-five dollars that they're smoking two packs a day, three thousand six hundred and fifty dollars. Most people don't even understand. They understand what they're spending, but when you sit there and say, I'm sure you can come up with something with thirty six hundred dollars a year. You can find something you want to spend. So I've had people come back and show me the golf clubs they bought, you know, they went on a cruise, I mean, and that's, that's every single year. I mean, these people are smoking 10, 20, 30 years. And it doesn't include the cost of their insurance going up because they're smokers. This isn't including the medications they have to take, whether it's antibiotics for their bronchitis or pneumonia, whether it's you know inhalers because they've developed emphysema, um, they have significant problems, they're on oxygen now. I mean, this stuff is expensive, all right? It's not the lost days of work because they gotta come in and see us because they're sick and they lose a day of work because they're coming in or they're out for a few days because they're having breathing difficulties. This $3,600 doesn't even include that. So you start throwing in that kind of money and you could get to eight, ten thousand dollars a year easily. And people are pretty shocked, going, wait a minute, I'm wasting that much money every year. That means something to them. Because I'll tell them, look, six months get down the road and you're gonna want to smoke. And you go in there, look at that jar full of money. I mean you got a thousand bucks in there. I bet you would never think to light a match and toss it in that jug. But if you start smoking again, that's exactly what you're doing. And that will motivate someone not to smoke more than me telling them about their health problems that they're going to have if, if they don't quit. Um, so that, that can make a, a, a big factor in that. Um, so some of the things that you know, I still want to talk to them about, because they're, they're still health issues and they've got to be kind of reminded of this, but what are some of the things that really health-wise benefit people when they quit smoking. So within a few minutes of stopping smoking, their heart rate starts to go down. Within 24 hours, their nicotine levels drop to about zero. Within several days, blood carbon monoxide levels start to go down. Uh, within the first 12 months, coughing, shortness of breath, all of this starts to improve. Within a couple of years, their risk of acute MI starts to drop. Within three to six years, their coronary heart disease risk um, is cut nearly in half. Um, after about five to 10 years, mouth, throat, and laryngeal cancers start to go down. And after about 10 years, risk of the esophagus, kidney, and bladder start to go down. And that's something people are really surprised on. Not only patients, but a lot of times providers because I think people forget the leading cause of bladder cancer is smoking. I mean, we always think of lungs, we always think of mouth, we always think of these types of things. We forget about that one. So, you know, you have patients coming in in their 50s, they've been smoking 15 years, and all of a sudden they're like, I'm noting some blood when I pee, okay? One of the things that runs through my mind is could this be bladder cancer? They're, they're heavy smokers. So there, there's things that you kind of have to remind them because for some reason having trouble breathing using inhaled oxygen isn't scary, but having a urostomy bag scares them to death. So you know those are the things I can run. And of course, after about 10 to 15, your lung cancer risk drops by about 50%. Um, you know we have screening things that we really encourage people to go through the low dose CT scans and that kind of stuff. Um, but these are the things that I kind of remind people. This is the other reason that you're, try, you're trying to quit. Um, people ask about vaping. 
uh, well, should I should I start vaping and I'll use that to taper off my smoking um, <clears throat> I encourage them not to because one you can vape almost anywhere uh, you know, there's a few places you can go to that may restrict vaping inside, but heck, I've seen people vaping in the movie theaters. I mean, you can do it almost anywhere. Um, they can adjust the levels of nicotine, so they can actually go up on the amount. And because they're doing it so frequently, their nicotine intake goes way up. And everything that they have that they associate with smoking, the jitters when they're trying to quit, and that kind of thing, um, it's easy for them to fall right back into smoking. And for younger kids, which we probably don't see as many people in their teens, 20s, and 30s starting smoking as much as we used to, but we see people vaping a whole lot more. Um, and that's an easy lead-in to starting to smoke. So I'm like, I really would recommend you try other things other than that, but if they're gonna vape, I tell them it's very limited, we're going to talk about this a lot because the idea is that you come off the vaping within a few months. Um, there have been some small studies coming out talking about lung inflammation and it even being greater than the smoking as far as inflammatory problems. So it's not risk-free, which a lot of people have an idea that it is. Um, so I encourage them um, to not vape. And that's it. So. Any questions at all?